one of the things I do is uh, not always uh, successful at this, but each year I sort of try to open myself up to something new, whether it's reading a different magazine I had read before, getting involved in a group that I'd not met, you know, involved with before, sort of always, if not reinventing myself, always exposing myself to something very different. And, and one of the amazing things about this is, and I, I do think we're all connected, is, is how many of those things kind of bring you back to connecting to things you've done and you can see how, um, you know, looking at a very far field opportunity, you can leverage something you've learned from from somewhere else. So, so I, I do think that the ADHD people in general are good at connecting the dots and seeing those patterns. So, uh, you know, that's why I said I sort of stumbled into innovation, but but uh, I sure ended up in the right place because I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it anyway. ADHD Rewired episode 367. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Michael Doherty, who is a lifelong innovator who has led a successful career for 35 years as a corporate executive, venture investor, entrepreneur, consultant, and a book author. He's also a happy husband of 35 years and father of three adult children. His goal, and I think it's probably all of our goals as parents, was to not screw them up. And he thinks he succeeded. As someone who was diagnosed with ADHD only five years ago, Mike says that he used to think that he stumbled into the right things, but in looking back, now sees it as a journey of learning to play to one's strengths and finding creative ways to compensate for the gaps. He's accomplished a lot, but with struggles, failures, and self-doubt along the way. Mike's message for all of us is to embrace who you are. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Eric. Great to be here. So when we were first talking, I think it was a a couple months ago, um, one of the the things that you shared with me, and I was so intrigued by this, you used to work uh, um, on a team at, at Sunbeam, and you said this team was known as the Island of Misfit Toys. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And, um, you know, the, the reason, and, and we use that really as an endearing term, um, it really came from the fact that uh, I've always been excited about building teams and being part of a of a, a really high energy team. And this was a situation, a turnaround of the company, a lot of pressure, a lot of struggles. We were running a business that wasn't really getting the attention of the company. It, quite frankly, was hard to recruit talent from elsewhere in the company into the team. Um and in some ways, I got some some other people's throwaways, frankly, the way they were, they were perceived, not on the fast track. But in reality, I think we all saw, uh, you know, what the skills were and how we could be so much more together that uh, it really became kind of a badge of honor to talk about, uh, you know, being the island of misfit toys, but how much we managed to get that business successfully turned around. And it was the highest performance team and, and most uh, rewarding experience of my, of my professional career. In fact, I... You know, I know we're doing this on a podcast, but I actually have a scrapbook where they gave me when I left of all the stories and all the uh, anecdotes that we kind of lived through together that they kind of gave me as a, as a parting gift. And I, I still look at it these days. Um, so it's interesting. So you're in this island of misfit toys and were one of the the most productive uh, uh, teams in the company, which is such an interesting sort of paradox of, of sort of ideas where when you're saying that you have all these other uh, people across the company who were kind of the throwaways, but we brought them all together. And uh, and what happened? Well, I, I, you know, I probably ought to go back a little bit just because uh this assessment context because Sunbeam, uh, it's a company I joined in, God, this is ages ago, 1999, uh, was a turnaround. 
Um, they had just fired a CEO named Chainsaw Al Dunlap, and I think the name says it all. So it was a company that had been mismanaged for years and years. Um, I came in as uh, recruited as a VP of new products um, uh, under the opportunity to kind of, here's an opportunity to apply what you know and have a clean sheet and help you know create a success story. I often said, if I knew what I was getting into, I never would have done it, but I'm glad I didn't know. So, so it really was this, uh, this, this chaos. Uh, you know, we, for example, made, made uh, appliances and, and they were making blenders in our uh, plant in Acuna, Mexico, driving them around the block without blades, putting them back in the warehouse so that they could call it a sale. Uh, you know, they were they were uh, shipping uh, tooling to China with nowhere to put it. There was 20 percent warranty returns at Walmart. We were getting kicked out at all the retailers. It was absolute chaos. And I and I give you that context because walking into a situation where some people had sort of lived through that, others like myself were coming into it new, um, you know, it's easy to sort of fall into the keep your head down, look out for yourself uh, approach and and quite frankly over over the first few years we had to kind of call the the organization a bit and, and make sure we had people that could really move forward with us and so um, you know again I wasn't diagnosed at the time as I think back to that there's a certain amount of chaos that I thrive in of being able to bring some order to that but we were on the ragged edge there I mean it was a lot of a lot of stress and a, and a lot of uh, a lot of difficulty so so to bring you up to to speed on this other piece we had already successfully turned the parent organization around, or at least we were on our way. And I was given a new assignment, which was to be a, a VP and general manager of another turnaround within a turnaround, the health division. And this is where um, I had to recruit a team that uh, was sort of a hodgepodge of businesses that were struggling worse than the parent company. Uh, we had just gone through the main turnaround. So you can imagine the difficulty I would have to recruit people to do it again. And uh, that's where sort of how we ended up with where we were. Uh, you know, it was uh, the health meter business, the Sunbeam Health at Home businesses put together. Um, we, we had um, moved some other divisions down to our location in Boca Raton, Florida. I, I brought a few people with me, but for the most part, we were building this team from the ground up. And, uh, you know, in, in the end, um, hired some people from the outside, moved some people from the inside. But uh, not sure why, but I think just because of the the situation and the people and, and uh, the, the luck, I would say, that uh, we just put together a, a really cool team. And, and uh, I always sort of look at that as my um, my model of, uh, you know, embracing diversity and, and different points of view when you put a team together and and, uh, and and sort of knowing what's possible if you can get sort of running on all cylinders in spite of, uh, you know, maybe some gaps in, in, in the resumes. So let me ask you this. So I know that we have a, a, probably a good amount of entrepreneurs listening to this podcast. And... I think a lot of us with ADHD, especially uh, those who are entrepreneurs, um, you know, we have a lot, a lot of ideas, right? And ideas are a dime a dozen, right? It's the implementation and the execution uh, of these ideas. So when one of the sort of, I guess, ADHD uh, traits may be that we are able to connect ideas and see patterns, how will... <laughs> You know, one of the things that you talk about is that um, looking at your strengths from the perspective of an innovator, right? So how is the innovative or the, the innovator approach to sort of like capturing ideas and actually executing, implementing? Because I'm, I'm hearing what you're talking about. And I'm like, this sounds like a lot of moving parts to, to kind of keep track of. And it's like, wow, like wh what, what was what was dropping? You know, so that's kind of my perspective. And what I'm curious about is how you're managing all of these sort of big things in these teams and and uh, and doing so with a pretty uh, looks like a pretty good track record of, you know, being able to say this is more than just luck. I don't do a lot of self introspection, but um, I don't know how much of this is about ADHD and sort of natural traits, and how much of it is just about me, and, and how much it's just you know right place, right time. But uh, I definitely know that uh, you know at one level, I really do believe in following my passions and sort of um, you know trusting my gut, my instincts, and 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 again not knowing why, but was always good at sort of connecting dots and 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 knowing good ideas. But at the same time, you know, as an example, my first job out of engineering school, and you know, and engineers are typically, you know, 
discipline. I, I'll tell you about my college career later, but um, I did get the degree. And um, my first job was as a project manager building chemical plants. So, um, you know, it's all of, it's not a lot of room for creativity. It's all about uh, project management, right? Which is not really the strong suit of ADHD people in general. Um, so for whatever reason, I, I, I have always sort of, uh, you know, been able to um, balance, not successfully always, but uh, in the long run, have this balance of uh, connecting ideas and, and, and focusing on, uh, you know, seeing opportunity, but also um, very passionate about wanting to see results. Um, I, I think I've learned over time that I'm a perfectionist and that I need other people to help me execute because I will um, you know, spend too much time on execution sometimes because of my perfectionist tendencies. But uh, uh, you can know, you, can you paint that picture for us a little bit? Cause I know I, mean, I, I wrestle with perfectionism. I know a lot of people with ADHD, especially people who are like very sort of driven and goal oriented, I think really do uh, really wrestle with perfectionism. How do you use other people to help you out of that sort of perf perfectionistic sort of neuroses, if you will? Well, I'll tell you, it's harder now, you know, being an entrepreneur and not having a large organization uh, to work with. But, you know, when you have an organization of 100 people, you can build a team around uh, around that. Um, but but without a doubt, uh, it, it sort of gets back to that island of misfit toys of, of having everyone play to their strengths. And and my strengths, I, I, I knew were always around um, systems thinking and, and seeing the big picture. Um, kind of being able to lay out plans. Here's a good example of that. Um, you know, when we were at Sunbeam again, uh, you know, certainly a chaotic situation, but, uh, you know, one of the things we did is we put in place some basic uh, business processes, a new product development process, a, a sales and operations process, a financial management review process. And so I had people running each of those areas, but um, what, what we were able to do is build a system you know, uh, basically a process for meetings, what the, what the reports would look like. Um, and you can let your perfectionism go there in a lot of ways that, uh, because you're building something that you're going to reuse and replicate. Uh, and so I found myself sort of a, wanting to focus my perfectionism on building systems that will then get me out of the day to day and repetitious work. And so we, we were really successful at building this cadence of um, kind of being able to manage the business in a chaotic situation by, by sh being sure that we had the right mechanisms in place to effectively manage the business in spite of all the stuff going on around us. And, and so, um, yeah, I'm always still fighting my perfectionism for sure. But uh, um, whether it's somebody working for me or people that I partner with, um, I, I, I'm, you know, pretty self-aware of where my gaps are and look for people. If, in fact, I just had a conversation with one of the contractors I work with sometimes and she and I get along great, but we both know we're too much alike. And so we know that there's a limit to how much we can do together because somebody has to come back and clean up the details. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for people that, uh, you know, when it comes to the idea generation, love people like that. When it comes to the execution, I need people that really bring a, a different skill set. Um, and it actually, it, you know, kind of reminds me of, you're going to see how unfocused my career has been. Um, I, I also have really uh, always thrived in, in being in situations that weren't sort of comfortable for me or typical for where I was in my career. Um, as an example, I, I left Ford Motor Company. I was in product planning and product development, and I went to a small industrial design firm. I was the first non-industrial designer they had ever hired, and I basically went to them and said, you know, let's turn this into a full service product development company. Give me a year. Um, you know, it was such an awakening for me to be a, uh, by their viewpoint, a left-brained engineer and MBA working with a bunch of right brain creatives. But in reality, I have always sort of gone back and forth between the two. And, and uh, you know, and each one of those experiences I take with me as, um, you know, a new skill set, a new experience I can look back on. Um, and, and I, you know, I would never be able to plan the career I've had but I wouldn't change literally any part of it because, you know, I, I kind of gets back to playing to your strengths. All those things kind of make you who you are and, and kind of get you ready for whatever is next. And, and I think I really got lucky in that respect. I want to circle back to something you said a, a moment or two ago about when you are building something that is going to be used as a system that is going to be um, sort of repeatable, that's going to be used over and over again. You sort of allow 
your what you're calling your, your perfectionism to kind of work in that space. And I think that's a like and I don't know if you have a distinction between perfectionism and excellence. I think it's a very fine line, uh, in the, you know, there. But I think, you know, for when we're trying to create these sort of um, uh, almost decision trees of like what what do we allow just to be good enough and what do we sort of let our tendencies uh, to to approach right so if if you have those perfectionistic tendencies even just asking yourself the question hey is this going to be something that I'm going to be using again and again and again yeah. if so maybe it's okay is this a one off thing if it is get it out and move on yeah, yeah. and and look at you know i'm i'm in my 60s and i'm still fighting that battle every day and so i, I you know i'm i'm far from uh, optimized here <laughs> but um but but I, I i definitely believe that and so one of the things i remind myself a lot because i still do a fair amount of consulting in addition to the ventures that i'm involved with um one of the things i constantly remind myself of is they're hiring for my brain not my reports i have to say that to myself because I'll say that again uh, they're hiring me, hiring me for my brain, not for my reports. And and it really is, you know, it's about the insights. And and you know, I can share those insights and you know, and new ways of thinking um, verbally and and in emails. And uh, you know, the final report is just uh, you know just the, the final wrapping. And so much of of my um, problems in the past. And look again, I'm I'm always still battling it. Is I get so wrapped up in, um, you know, equating those deliverables to my self-worth that, uh, you know, I want to be perfect. I want those to be perfect. They reflect on me. And there's a rational part of it reflecting on your brand. But uh, I know that I've been out of balance in a lot of in a lot of situations. And uh, I go back to, uh, you know, some of it is about complimenting yourself with other people that, that can sort of help you break out of that. And I think some of it is, is gravitating to work that um, allows you to do that kind of, uh, you know, to play to your strengths as well. Uh, but as a consultant, um, you know, as somebody who uh, delivers information to uh, to clients, that's probably the the, the biggest battle I, I still have is because I, uh, as much as I say it, I still uh, find myself wrapped up in equating the deliverables to, uh, you know, ref- what, what are they going to think of me? And, you know, you know I, I actually had a typo on that report. Oh, my God. And uh, did, did, off, did the world come to a crashing halt with that typo? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, of course not. No, I mean, when you <laughs> said, Michael, that that they're hiring you for your brain, not your reports, I mean, I I immediately thought of like 15 different people. I'm like, oh, they need to hear this line right here. Because yes, they, how much time some of us spend on just the writing process. You know, I think sometimes when we have a, a brain that sort of connects ideas very quickly, right? Having to write their report that explains all this, the things yeah, yeah. requires a linear process, and it's hard. Yeah. Well, and and look, I you know one of the things I've also learned in the more recent years, and and uh, you know I I actually never had therapy or coaching along the way, but I, I uh, actually got uh, some therapy in the in not long after I got diagnosed uh, around cognitive behavior therapy, and and. Um, you know, she actually pointed me much more toward my perfectionism than my ADHD, which is all, all sort of wrapped up together. You know, a, a fair amount of that was really um, getting away from the self-talk, sort of feeling like I need to think my way through why I'm behaving this way and then think differently to make it happen versus just protecting myself from those tendencies, using timers, using, um, for, as an example, when I write a PowerPoint or a report, um, I would get so sort of micro focused on wanting to be, you know, make it right all as you go. Whenever I find myself in that, first of all, I, I'm, I'm still a stickler for setting timers to just say, you know, every 20 minutes, where are you? I, and whenever I start to fall off the wagon, I start to fall back into that. Um, I even have a little box that has marbles in it. And, and here's the hours you have to put in a project for a week. And I watch them move from one to the other. But I tend to be off and on again. You know, I use those things when I'm falling off the wagon and Me feeling too. in a rut. Um, but 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 they help a lot. But the mechanism, one of the tricks I've been using uh, on on these reports is is getting disciplined around um, really making sure that um, I don't let myself um, do any editing, any graphics, any of the formatting before I have the storyline written and the rough draft done. Which sounds logical and. Um, but it's a hard discipline for me to follow through on because I just keep wanting to do more and I have to catch myself. But I think just this sort of setting those rules for myself and catching myself 
is what helps me a lot to break out of it. You know, the tendencies will always be there. I'm, I'm not going to change. I am who I am. But um, I think this balance of kind of being comfortable in who, with who I am and um, complementing myself with other people and putting mechanisms in place to protect me from myself are all working pretty well for me. You had said that uh, innovation is much more about relationships and people than technology. What I want to do is take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, I want to talk more about how we use relationships and engage with people uh, to really innovate in our lives. So we will be right back. Support for this podcast comes from the ADHD Rewired Coaching Community, which includes our growing alumni membership community. We've had more than 600 people go through these coaching groups where members from past seasons get to know one another, continue their support, and continue to grow. The Rewired Coaching Community also includes our intensive online coaching and accountability groups that run for 10 weeks, four times a year. Our next season of coaching groups start April 7th and go through June 18th. Have you been a longtime listener of this podcast, but haven't had a chance to join? Maybe you've been thinking about joining for a while, but haven't made the first step yet. Good news. It's not too late because if you are listening to this episode on the day it came out, there is still time to register for our third and final registration event this Thursday, March 18th at 1.30 p.m. Central. The deadline to RSVP is tomorrow, so don't wait. Take that first step and start your journey here. Go to coachingrewired.com and click on the big green button. From there, we'll get you the next steps to RSVP for our final registration event. Our journeys with ADHD may have its winding roads and squirrels galore, but that doesn't mean we have to navigate those roads alone. Join us on Thursday, March 18th at 1.30 p.m. Central for our third and final registration event for our 24th season of coaching and accountability groups. If you're listening to this on the day it came out, the deadline to RSVP is tomorrow. So if you want to register but can't do it right now, what can you do right now to remind yourself to go to coachingrewired.com? Whether it's writing it down or setting an alarm or reminder for yourself, we hope you'll join us this Thursday March 18th. Go to coachingrewired.com to register. That's coachingrewired.com. Hope to see you there. If you're thinking about joining this group, know that you're not alone and that you can accomplish so much more. The structure and the support, I mean, there's magic in the group work. There's magic in working with a community of other ADHDers who all understand and offer support and new strategies. So it's like if a person is ready to be done living life on hard mode and wants to make progress through the group, it's life changing. That's coachingrewired.com. Would you like to have a virtual co-working space for adults with ADHD? Would you like to be a founding member of ADHD Rewired's Adult Study Hall membership community, which we are aiming to open at the end of March? Did I mention that the first 100 members, our founders, will get to lock in 50% off their membership for life? Get 24-hour access to virtual co-working with a variety of facilitated themed work sessions throughout the week for only $19.99 a month and only $9.99 a month for the first 100 founding members. You'll never have to work alone again. To become a founder, go to adultstudyhall.com. That's adultstudyhall.com. All right, we are back with Michael Doherty. All right, Michael, so... You, you had said to me that um, innovation is much more about relationships and people uh, than it is about technology. You mean, so there's not going to be some perfect like app out, out, app out there that's going to like solve <laughs> all of our, our problems? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe, but uh, ultimately it still comes down to people, you know, working together to, to get that done, right? Um, and, and, you know, one of the, the first points I would make there is that uh, just the game has changed in terms of what innovation is. You know, it used to be, it was about uh, making a, you know, new flavor, slightly better. Um, that was called innovation. And now what we used to call innovation is now just table stakes. Now it's what it takes to stay in the game. 
So, you know, because mm -hmm. of reduced uh, uh, product life cycles, because of, uh, uh, you know, all the uh, multitude of solutions that are out there for people, the rising expectations, think about how long you used to be willing to wait for a cab and now you're frustrated if you're Uber, I'm not speaking about current coronavirus time, but uh, you know, generally waiting for a, a taxi or, or, or uh, for an Uber, our, our expectations have changed dramatically. So, so part of it is just that the level of innovation that we're being asked to do is so much more. But where, I, where I'm going with that is that innovation also used to be something that was done by R&D labs and internal teams. These days, um, and the label is usually open innovation or collaborative innovation, innovation is a team sport out be within an organization, but beyond the organization. And so that in order to innovate successfully, you have to have relationships uh, and kind of feelers out to know what's happening in the world, uh, to know there's too much going on. There are too many good ideas and too many smart people beyond your walls, not to make them part of your innovation process. And so, um, you know, within an organization, um, there's no way you can innovate without doing it as a team effort. Um, I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll go back to the Sunbeam example. Uh, uh, one of the things that we did um, early on when we were um, trying to basically um, reinvent the product line was, and, and remember we had 20% warranty returns. Our products were crap. We were just buying time to, to, uh, to come up with new ones is we sent our engineers out into the field to um, watch consumers, to talk to consumers. I, you know, cause I wanted them to be able to picture that, woman or that family as they were designing the product and really understand what the consumer needed and what, what they were going to do. And, and you know, ultimately, you know, getting the marketers and the engineers and everyone kind of on the same page around the consumer's problem um, goes a long way toward um, you know, being able to actually execute against it. Um, and so internal innovation and internal collaboration, it, it is a team sport. But it's uh, it's more complicated now, and I actually think more exciting, in that uh, you know there's so many more opportunities to collaborate with people in other parts of the world. Uh, you know, uh, I, I run challenges with uh, clients and, and partners where we'll put a problem out on HeroX or another platform, and a kid with a computer in India will come up with an idea just as good as some high-paid PhD scientist in Cincinnati, Ohio. And, and so we, you know. Getting good at um, you know finding ideas anywhere is 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 important, um, but then I think actually the, where the competitive advantage comes for businesses is having preferred relationships where you know you have you know you have a reputation as a company or a startup as a partner of choice as someone that uh, people want to work with and come back time and time again. Um, I, I, in fact, I think it's actually going to blur the lines between what's the definition of an organization. I actually think that uh, you know organizations in the future will be much less defined by you know the um, the annual report in the building and and more about um, a combination of the brands, the people on the inside, and the relationships they have on the outside. And for somebody like me, who whatever call it, you know whether it's ADHD or just who I am, who loves the idea of the diversity of work and connecting dots. Um, it's, it's, you know, couldn't be a better line of business in that respect. So I, I enjoy it. And, and I'll, I'll give you another uh, example of this. You know, one of the things that uh, maybe this kind of, kind of goes back to the island of misfit toys. Uh, I, I've always admired and love working with people who are just very different from me and, um, you know, sort of bring something near to the table um, and really, really value that. Um, I have a good friend named Mike Renoni who runs a business called uh, PCD Works Down in Texas. And Mike is an architect and a psychologist, but he runs a technology, um, basically uh, think tank in the East Hills of Texas. They'll solve any technical problem that no other company can. They, they, they've got material scientists, they've got PhD uh, uh, electrical engineers, they've got a machine shop. Uh, they're, they're right now bringing, they've got a team in there from Stanford that's uh, launching a new oil and, oil and gas startup within the confines of the campus. But but I go back to, um, you know, maybe it's the island of misfit toys again. I, I, I could see in Mike Renoni when I first met him many, many years ago, this guy had something and I've really nurtured that relationship and valued it over time. And he's grown into this really you know, renowned um technical wizard that uh, I kind of consider one of my secret weapons. And so I, I think that's how relationships can really be kind of, uh, you know, important in innovation. It isn't just about what you're thinking of. It's about, um, you know, having the people in your network that can bring new ideas to it, but then also having the mindset to 
not be so married to what you're thinking of, but rather just seeing an idea for what it is. So focusing on the idea, not necessarily the person who has the idea, because it's sort of letting go of ego and focusing just actually on the idea that will drive uh, forward movement. Let me let me ask you this. I don't know if if this is a question that you can answer or not. So I'm I'm thinking about um, listeners who are thinking, man, I would really belong on this island of misfit toys. Um, How how do I find that island? Yeah, um, interesting question. You know, at one level. You know, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're, I would say it's harder working for a large company, no doubt. But uh, I I think these islands are everywhere. Um, I think that in the startup world, if you can put up with a little bit of uh, chaos and and a little less security, there are lots of those opportunities. Um, I also think in large companies, um, and and in my book, I talk about this, that, uh, you know, there are these champions that are kind of at the edges that uh, are barely surviving in the company because they're breaking all the rules. They're kind of doing things without uh, permission um, and they're getting things done. And uh, I found that people will tend to um, seek out others like that or that are sort of like-minded in that. Um, And so even in a large company, I think you can be one of those people and find others like you and sort of seek them out uh, and and, uh, find, find ways to collaborate with them. So let me ask you this. What about the the person who is in one of these companies and they, they are the, the person that kind of swims upstream and goes against the mold and is like challenging sort of the, the status quo in that organization? You know, when you work in, an, in a large organization, there's always a risk. If you if you buck too hard, you get bucked off the, the, the horse and your bronco. I'm mixing metaphors here, but you, that you, you get shut in the door. Right. What could you what would you recommend to people who really have this innovative spirit, see these really uh, great opportunities? opportunities, um, but maybe are finding themselves in trouble or like trying to stop, like, get themselves fired. Um, what would you recommend to those, those individuals? Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a great point. And I've, and I've, uh, seen it live some of it. The first thing I would say is that, uh, I think when it comes to innovation and new product development, that you need to work within this, this, I don't think is counter to what I said. I think it's, it, it can also be true. Do you need to work within the risk tolerance of the organization? Uh, so, so I think, you know, trying to get a company to do something that's just not going to happen because of regulatory requirements or the strategy um, is, is, you know, you have to kind of know what's possible, but, but you know, push and, and find ways to sort of get around uh, systems. So that's, you know, to me, that, that's uh, definitely uh, part of it. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Because, you know, you, you, you've done a lot of uh, your work on building relationships. So I'm wondering when it comes to sort of those just kind of people skills, if, uh, if someone's thinking, well, every time I push, I end up getting fired. Um, what, what are some like actual tactical strategies for pushing in a way that doesn't get yourself pushed out the door? Yeah, so two things come to mind. One would be... Um, you know, you need to find advocates. You need to find other people who are like-minded. And and certainly, if you can find, if you're in in the uh, you know the more junior levels of an organization, if you can find a champion who's at a more senior level who will uh, basically provide some air cover for you, that's ideal. Um, I wouldn't overuse that, and I wouldn't abuse it. But uh, certainly, having some air cover is always a good thing. Uh, but then again, finding finding some safety in numbers is is a good thing as well. But but there's another part of it which is. Um, uh, and maybe we'll come back and talk more about this, but uh, I'm a big believer in sort of paradoxical thinking. I guess it's something else I've stumbled into. And a lot of the things we're really talking about are these sort of either ors. And and I really believe in this is true with innovation that, uh, you know, kind of reframing either or questions into and um, approaches um, is a big part of this. So in the context of being a rebel, um, you need to also look at, you know, there's all the upside. If, if the company would listen to me, here's all the great things we could accomplish because of our ideas. But look at it on the downside. If we went too far down this road, here's all the things that could go wrong. We could go off strategy. We could have limited resources. We could lose our focus on the core business. Similarly, um, on the core side, you know, if we only focus on the core, we become bureaucratic and slow. But if we ignore that too much, then we, um, you know, we again lose lose focus and we end up, uh, you know, losing our competitive edge. So, as somebody who's a rebel, I think a good part of this is understanding what the other side of the equation is about and what the concerns are. If people are, you know, if people are threatened by you, 
then it isn't just that they don't like you, it's that you're threatening something that they think is important for the health of the company generally. And so understanding what they're afraid of can help you frame what you're talking about in ways to say, look, I understand that. Here's how we can maybe mitigate against it. Maybe we, do, we run a small experiment to make sure we don't put our brand up uh, at that kind of risk, but at least find out if the market opportunity is there. Or maybe we partner with someone on the outside and invest in it instead of doing it ourselves. So, so understanding the other side of the equation and uh, what those concerns are helps you be a better navigator of that and, and kind of be able to see uh, both sides of it. Okay, so... I'm hearing a lot of sort of themes around like this, this connection about really sort of reading the organization that you're in, uh, about being able to push, not pushing too hard, um, finding the, the, the allies. When it comes to really like if we if we would apply all of these things to say the the innovation it takes to live life successfully managing ADHD. Right. So it's sort of the business of you and your life. Right. How do you apply principles of innovation uh, to sort of ADHD life management? Well, that's interesting. Um, can't say I've thought of that much about that. Uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe at, at one level, some of the mechanisms I've put in place um, uh, are, are some of that, you know, creative ways to trick myself to, to behave better and get and to get things done. Um I also um, believe that in the same way that, you know, when it comes to innovation, you got to start with what's the market need, what's the customer pain point. And so, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, me as the the product or the, the end game, um, you need some perspective too. So, you know, asking people for their perspectives on me, um, mm. you know, what do they think about, you know, she said I was a perfectionist. Do you think I'm a perfectionist? Tell me how, tell me how you think that. Um, you know, getting that sort of uh, more objective viewpoint of what you're doing. And, and I, you mentioned I've been married for 35 years. She's the most objective uh, viewpoint I, I've got. She knows me pretty darn well. You know, when I got diagnosed, it, it was no surprise to her. But, but uh, you know, being, being able, whether it's a spouse or other people you work with, being able to get that sort of fresh set of eyes uh, goes a long way. Plus, plus I think... Uh, you know, I am a systems thinker, thinker, and I do think that innovation isn't just about ideas. I mean, there, there's no shortage of ideas in the world. It really is about getting things uh, realized. And, and so, um, you know, kind of building systems that allow you to um, have kind of a, uh, a pipeline of ideas and a pipeline of connection to execute again against them is important. One of the things I do is uh, not always uh, successful at this, but each year I sort of try to open myself up to something new, whether it's reading a different magazine I had read before, getting involved in a group that I'd not met, you know, involved with before. Sort of always, if not reinventing myself, always exposing myself to something very different. And, and one of the amazing things about this is, and I, I do think we're all connected, is, is how many of those things kind of bring you back to connecting to things you've done and you can see how, um, you know, looking at a very far field opportunity, you can leverage something you've learned from, from somewhere else. So, so I, I do think that the ADHD people in general are good at connecting the dots and seeing those patterns. So, uh, you know, that's why I said I sort of stumbled into innovation, but, but uh, I sure ended up in the right place because I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it anyway. Let's see this. I want to hear a little bit more about uh, maybe some of the how you personally manage your ADHD, um, as well as coming back to uh, where we where we kind of put a pin in earlier. You said you had some uh, interesting stories from your college career. So let's take a quick break and let's uh, let's find out a little bit more about you as a person living with ADHD. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our Patreon community. Can I ask you something? How has this podcast helped you? What have you learned that has been your biggest takeaway? Have you considered becoming a patron because you get a new aha moment about your ADHD each week? If you do, consider giving a monthly contribution to help support this podcast. We want to welcome Carolyn R. at the $10 a month level. Thank you, Carolyn. Your contribution not only supports the podcast, but it helps me grow our team. So we can provide you with even more fun events and resources and continue expanding our reach to people with ADHD everywhere. If you want an extra boost of support, patrons at the $25 a month level can join me for a monthly coaching call on Zoom every fourth Tuesday of the month 
at 3 p.m. Central. It's a great way to get started and get a taste of a coaching group. You can also check out our other perks on Patreon. Contributors at the $10 a month level can listen to all the replays from our past monthly coaching calls. Who knows? Maybe there's another big aha in there waiting for you. And if you want ad-free episodes, you can get those in a separate RSS feed at the $5 a month level. However, if you don't mind the ads that help keep you up to date with our most recent upcoming events, you can still support us at just $3 a month. It's a great way to show a bit of financial support if this podcast has helped steering you in a positive direction along your ADHD journey. All levels include being able to chat and leave comments with other members of the Patreon community. It's one more way you can connect with your fellow ADHD brains. That being said, any contribution is welcome and very much appreciated. And if you are currently unable to support us financially right now, that's 100% okay. I know it's been a wacky past 12 months and then some, so I totally understand. However, if you do want to become a patron and get some cool perks or that extra boost of support, please consider supporting us by becoming a patron over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. Hey, if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to ADHD Rewired. But do you know about the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network? Check out Hacking Your ADHD with Will Kerb, who is also an alumni member of our coaching community. Hacking Your ADHD is the podcast where you can get quick and actionable tips to help you work with your ADHD brain so you can do more of the things that you want to do. Stick around to the end of each episode for a good laugh at some really cringe-worthy, fantastic dad jokes. Last week, Will talks about understanding our ADHD and how pop culture reinforces stereotypes that don't really reflect what ADHD is all about. Go to HackingYourADHD.com to find more about Will, his podcast, and show notes from every episode. Are you a parent with ADHD or have a child with ADHD? Could it also be true that both apply to you? Then check out ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan, where conversations with parents, educators, and experts help to give everyone a healthy perspective on more ways to navigate with our ADHD. Whether it's our kids, in our homes, or even our relationships, Brendan's insights, along with his guests, dive deep into the ways we can better take care of ourselves with our ADHD brains. In one of his recent episodes, Brendan shares his thoughts on self-talk as he walks us through the three C's of the self-talk model. Head on over to ADHDessentials.com to find out more about Brendan, his podcast, and his online parent coaching groups. And the latest podcast to join the ADHD Rewired podcast family is ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens, a Canadian-born Asian with ADHD. MJ offers a different perspective on navigating with ADHD with a focus on reaching out to the Asian community and underrepresented communities through storytelling. Last Wednesday, MJ gave her personal perspective about reminders and how not all reminders have the effect we desire. It's been pretty neat to listen to MJ as she discovers her voice while sharing her experiences and insights, all while keeping it light with fun and a bit of humor. Also, MJ, I know you're listening to this and I'm not the only one wondering, when are the interviews coming out? Head on over to ADHDdiversified.ca to learn more and to keep up with her latest episodes. And finally, soon to join the ADHD Rewired podcast family is the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle with Moira Maven. Did you know that Moira is now one of our coaches for the next season of our coaching groups? You've likely heard her in our Q&A episodes and have seen her if you've joined us during our monthly live Q&As, which we do every second Tuesday of the month at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. Go to ADHDrewired.com and click on the Events tab to register for that. Coming out this month, Moira's show will be focusing on building an ADHD-friendly lifestyle to reduce frustration and overwhelm. After all, what better way to create an ADHD-friendly life today so we can have a better tomorrow? Visit her website at ADHDFriendlyLifestyle.com and sign up so you can stay in the loop about when her podcast airs. I am so excited. We're continuing to grow. This is the podcast network by ADHDers for ADHDers with a little something for everyone. You can subscribe to all of our podcasts on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 
and to all of our listeners, whether you've been listening for a while or you're new to the network and discovering us for the first time. We appreciate you so much. You can now check out all of the ADHD Rewired Podcast and Network Podcasts by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network. All right, we are back. All right, so um, I think during the first part of the conversation, you had made a mention about an interesting college career. And the only reason I remember to come back to it was because I wrote that down. Um, Otherwise, I would have just been a side note that we never got back to. So tell us uh, this interesting college career story. Well, um, I was not a high performer. Let's just sum it up that way. Uh, Even in high school, um, and it's so obvious now, but back then, um, you know, I was not, I was a smart enough kid for sure. But, uh, you know, off, off the rails, not doing the right things, uh, came from a pretty dysfunctional family. Uh, mother had mental illness. My father was uh, an alcoholic, uh, um, seven kids. You know, I was the middle child who sort of played parent when, when I was the, the last one left. So it was kind of a strange childhood. Um, and school was sort of the last thing on my list of priorities for sure. Beer, beer was above that. And, and, um, and so I, I struggled in high school. Um, my dad actually came back from a business trip and then pulled me out of high school and sent me to a private school that, uh, made me repeat 11th grade. So I ended up spending an extra year to get to college. And I, you know, uh, kind of thank him for that. But at least it got me back in the right track. But even when I went to college, I, I went to uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia. Uh, I was going to be a mechanic. I just, and, and decided I would be a mechanical engineer instead. And, and, um, I hadn't, really done the basics of algebra in high school that well. Uh, uh, you need algebra to do calculus. And so um, I did not do well with my, uh, with my early college career. I, uh, I went to a school where it was a five-year program, a co-op program where you worked uh, six months and went to school six months. Six months and I flunked out by the uh, end of my first uh, academic semester. Um, I think my worst one was a C, a D, and two Fs. And uh, so it would have been easy for that to have been in the end of it. But uh, I, I think it's it, it was sort of a, a drive that I had that I, I knew that I wanted to get that degree. I, I knew that I didn't want to be a typical technical engineer, but I wanted that um, sort of way of thinking and that, you know, that that uh, that degree. But more importantly, that that sort of training to think uh, about problem solving that way. Um, and I, again, I played to my strengths. So, so what I did was um, I threw myself into extracurricular activities. I, uh, I was one of the editors on the student newspaper. Um, in later years, I became the student dean of engineering. Um, I held every office from uh, 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 Archon to president of my fraternity. Uh, and, and I really sort of um, you know, threw myself into the leadership side and, the, and the, more or less the team and organizational side of it where I was really good. Um, and fortunately, along the way, I found ways to also kind of settle down and recognize I needed the degree. I needed to do a certain amount of work to get there. Um, you know, if, I'll never forget getting ready for a final when I uh, hadn't done much work all semester. And it was a choice between, you know, continuing to do that or going bowling with my friends. And I chose bowling. And so, uh, it, you know, it, it, was, it was absolutely a battle. But, but in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of... Uh, getting to the end game, I knew that uh, if I had that leadership experience and did good enough at school, you know, I had like a 2728 in my um, later years, but I still had f- five or six job offers at the end of school because of the fact that my resume was so strong um, that I showed leadership experience. And that's why I ended up with a project engineering uh, uh, job. Five years, fast forward five years later, I ended up going to Kellogg for business school and um, you know, business school is not as hard as, as engineering school, but I, I wanted to prove to myself that I could do well. So I ended up with a three, seven. So I, you know, I, I just said, all right. So it's, it was applying myself. It wasn't that I wasn't smart enough. Um, but, but, you know, maybe I was more mature, but, but without a doubt, um, I, I was, uh, I was scattered and, um, you know, not good at applying myself in school. And in a lot of ways, I think I was probably masking the fact that I couldn't concentrate you know, that I really couldn't put myself in the room for hours and keep looking at the same stuff. My mind would just wander that, uh, I, you know, I, I think in the end, it was a way to protect myself from that and not get all depressed and stressed about it. I just said, well, I did the best I could. I'm moving on. And, and I found another way to compensate, which is, uh, you know, I got good enough. I got better at it. I've uh, got some of my engineering friends that could have helped me, but then I, I, I sort of 
played to my strengths and, and focused more on the leadership side and you know, got through it. And it wasn't until my kids got um, well into college that I shared with them what my um, background was, but uh, they're, they're all better achievers than, than, than I am at school and, and you know, much more disciplined. So as I said early on, I, my goal was not to screw them up. So I think I succeeded in that. Yeah, I think it's the, it's the uh, I, I like to phrase it as our goal. So just to minimize how much we screw up our kids. Yeah, yeah. So you were not diagnosed, though, until about five years ago, right? Yeah, that's right. What was going on at that point that brought you to the diagnosis? Well, I, I think I, you know, I've had probably uh, two, three, four times in my life where you just get into, you know, a, a point where you're just not coping with it very much anymore. And, and so my business was not doing that well. Um, I, you know, the more stressed I got, the less I was able to concentrate um, you know, things weren't going that great with the family. There were just, uh, issues that were happening. And, and I think it was just grinding me down to the point where I couldn't function quite frankly. And, and so, um, uh, I ended up, uh, you know, getting a coach at first and then, um, she didn't recommend it, but, uh, separately my, my sister actually, um, recommended I, I, you know, go get, uh, diagnosed and, uh, sure enough, it didn't take long to, you know, to get the diagnosis and, uh, uh, that, you know, it, it, it definitely helped me, but, um, I would also say, you know, it, was, it helped me sort of be at peace with it. But I also think that, um, my more recent therapy helped me many, in some ways, maybe more, because I, I don't know what to blame on ADHD, dysfunctional childhood. It doesn't really matter how you got there. I think in the end, um, it's about, you know, what you do from this point forward. And, and I think she actually helped me, you know, stop looking backwards and, and look forward and, and also to not hang everything, even though the ADHD has been a fairly recent thing, not hang it all on that, but to also, you know, look at how the perfectionism is really kind of driving some of that and, and compounding it. Hmm. So you had said earlier that, um, well, you, one of the challenges you, you, uh, I guess had was, uh, your, your report writing, but you're also writing books. Yeah. Tell us about it. So you have this uh, a book that uh, is, was recently released. Uh, actually, it's been more than four years now, okay. so it's time for another. But uh, it, it, uh, it's amazing how how quickly time goes. But yeah, it, it was a, a goal that I had for a number of years. You know, a loose goal for probably ten years, but um, I, I think uh, a goal, a hard goal for maybe two years before that. Um, and it was one of those inflection points where I said, all right, time to reinvent myself, time to kind of go to the next level and, and do something a little bit different. And I wanted to use the book to take my business away from sort of traditional open innovation consulting, which is about matching large companies and startups to what I saw as the next thing, which is about corporations and startups and entrepreneurs actually building new businesses together. And uh, that's what I saw as sort of the next big thing. And, um, and sure enough, it's what's happening more and more now. Um, but, but so the book was, was focused on that. So the good news is because I had been blogging and writing articles um, and sort of testing concepts and not to mention all the consulting work, that gave me lots of um, fuel for that. But I also, um, you know, spun my wheels quite a bit in terms of what the actual theme would be and how to get started. Um, and so once again, I complemented my weaknesses by hiring someone on the outside. I initially hired someone who was going to be a ghostwriter. Um, but we found out quickly that wasn't going to work um, because I, I like to write and I, I really had strong opinions about the way I wanted to be my voice. And so after the introduction and halfway through chapter one, she became the editor and I became the writer. And, and so that worked great. Interesting. Um, and, and so we started by kind of uh, um, outlining the book uh, as a uh, kind of paragraph form of, you know, write a paragraph of what chapter one's about, what chapter two is about, what chapter three is about. So you kind of know what the key messages are. Mm. And that became sort of the starting roadmap. And then uh, we got into a discipline. And again, she held me accountable for, um, you know, at every, whatever it was, three weeks, I needed to get the next draft of the next chapter in rough form to her. And she'd be giving me back the edits from the previous chapter and, and, and keeping that cadence going. So there's no doubt I could not have done that on my own having that external um, resource um, uh, helping me and driving me um, went a long way towards that. Um, but interestingly, you know, we were probably three quarters, even more done with the book. And I got to a point where I felt stuck. I just wasn't happy with some where it was going. 
And her advice was, look, everyone feels this way, power through it, it's gonna work out. And I trusted my instincts. I said, no, I need to stop. I need to give this some time. Um, and she, her, her thing was, once you stop, it's never gonna happen. Um, and so I sort of took that as a challenge perhaps, but, um, <laughs> sparked your ramble tendencies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I did end up stopping for a couple of months, um, and, and, and thinking about it. And actually I ended up throwing away a third of what I had written and taking it in a slightly different direction, but it clicked at that point. And then the rest of the book was so much easier. So did you continue working with her? Yeah, I did. I did. I came back to her and she, and she you know, I had actually had, had to actually wait for her a little bit at that point because she was busy with other things. But she took me on again. And then we finished we finished the book. And uh, and, and it was uh, it was great for me. And it was uh, and one of those things like the job I, I mentioned uh, where I, I, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't know what I was getting into here, but I'm glad I didn't. And um, it, it's the book I wanted to write, but I didn't know what the book was going to be when I when I started. So uh, I was I was really kind of like my business when I started the podcast. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought you'd be here today doing right, this? Right, right. So uh, the book is Collective Disruption. Who's, who's your target audience there? Uh, I, I've actually aimed it more at uh, corporate executives who are looking to um, work with entrepreneurs and kind of reinvent their businesses uh, by um, uh, highlighting the entrepreneurs in the, in the company and learning to work with startups and entrepreneurs on the outside. But it's also directed at entrepreneurs that want to get in the door, know how companies think. Um, so, so while the voice of the book is aimed at corporate executives, um, um, I found that uh, startups and entrepreneurs value it as well because it helps them uh, kind of see what it's about um, on the corporate side as well. All right. Well, uh, Michael Doherty, this is all the time that we do have uh, for today. Can you uh, share our website? How can people learn more about you and, uh, and your work? Yeah, great. Boy, the time flew. So uh, th thanks for the time. Yeah, my uh, current website is a company called Next Big, this venture creation firm. And it's at uh, nextbigco.com. And uh, my uh, Twitter is uh, at M.E. Doherty. Uh, my email, I'll give you that too, is uh, mdoherty at nextbigco.com. Um, love to connect to people who are thinking, thinking about innovation and uh, even thinking about ADHD and innovation. So I'd love to, love to connect with people. Awesome. Well, we'll get the links uh, to those on the show notes for this episode, which uh, you can always find at ADHDrewired.com slash whatever episode number that is. Just put that number after the slash. It'll go right to uh, to this page. So, uh, Michael, thank you so much. My, my pleasure. And I guess I should mention uh, Collective Disruption is on Amazon. That's going to be the best place to find that as well. Awesome. Thanks for letting us know that. Really enjoyed it, Eric. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. 
and be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.